أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In corners of the world, majority of them are born in non-Muslim houses. Allah knows best how long they're going to live in this world without the blessing of Islam. So for this also we should be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another great blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon all of us, He made us in the nation, the Ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The last nation to come in this world, but the first nation to enter Jannah on the Day of Judgment. For this honor that Allah has bestowed upon us, we would have been Muslims. But if Allah would have sent us in the nation of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, or Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, or Sayyidina Dawood alayhi salam, we could never have attained the same level and the same honor and the same grace that Allah has bestowed upon the Ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So for this we should be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for the last couple of sittings we had started this topic, family disputes, family disputes, reasons and solutions. In the light of the Quran and the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what are the factors that contribute towards family disputes or disputes in the neighborhood or disputes among communities and human beings on a general level? And what are the solutions provided to us by Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam regarding these disputes? As mentioned last time, the famous hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Muslim alladhi yukhalitun nasa wa yasbiru ala adhahum, a Muslim, a believer who intermingles with the people, keeps his relationship with the people, he has to bear some pain and suffering and some hurt from the opposite side. And on, on another hand, on the flip side, if a Muslim does not intermingle with the people, does not keep up his relationship, stays aloof, stays himself, keeps himself detached from the society, he does not have to bear any pain and suffering from the opposite side, which is more favorable in the sight of Allah, which Muslim is more preferred in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a Muslim who intermingles with the people and then he is patient or she is patient upon the calamities or the pain and suffering he has to bear from the opposite side. So this hadith gives us a principle as long as we are living in this dunya, people will hurt us. People will break our feelings, will break our heart. People will cause pain and suffering to us, whether they are blood relatives, whether they are near friends, whether they are far away friends, or whether they are people in the neighborhood on a general level. This is the rule and fundamental of life in this world if you want to stay within the dunya and keep up the relationships with the people. So disputes will be there, but what are the solutions to this? Nobody is perfect. We all human beings, we all make mistakes, whether young or old, but a person should have remorse upon the mistake he made in in the past and should try his best to avoid it in the future. So the first many factors are mentioned in the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The first that we mentioned was having takabbur, having arrogance, that I am something and I am better than the others. Why doesn't, why doesn't the opposite person respect me based on my level? We went in detail regarding this. The second reason because of which these disputes usually arise is double standards. Whether in our own house or whether in the masjid or whether in the locality, whether among our relatives, whether at our job places, there should not be double standards. Islam does not accept this. The same standard that we choose for ourselves and for our children, we should choose for others also and choose for the children of others also. Third thing that we mentioned last time was when these calamities come upon us, when, up, up, when the opposite person breaks our heart or does some damage to us or becomes a source of pain and suffering for us, we should have patience. We should have sabr for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And secondly, we should look upon the good qualities of every human being. Stay away from the negative things that are there in everyone. Myself, first of all, and all of us, we have weaknesses. We have shortcomings. We try to look for the weaknesses in each other. We can never live together. We can never be helpful to each other. It will be difficult even in the masjid to stay together for the time of salah. So we should overlook the shortcomings and the mistakes. Rather look look for the good things, for the positive side, the good qualities the person has and benefit from those good qualities. This is what we mentioned last time. And we mentioned how sometimes there were disagreements between Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his blessed wives also. How there was disagreement sometime between Abu Bakr radiallahu an and Umar radiallahu an also. Or among the sahaba.
Sahaba radiyallahu anhum in general and how they used to solve these problems and how they used to provide solutions for this. Moving forward for the same, on the same t factor, that is, people cause us pain and suffering and we have to bear them, we have to be patient upon them. We'll continue with this today, inshallah, if it finishes. Then we'll move on the fourth factor. There's a hadith mentioned by Imam Bukhari rahimahullah in his Sahih. It is also mentioned by Imam Ahmad rahimahullah. And the two, there are two narrations with a slight difference of meaning. The one that I'm going to present in front of you is the narration of Musnad Ahmad. Imam Bukhari rahimahullah mentions this in Adab al-Mufrad also. He says that uh, Abu Musa radiallahu an says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Laysa ahadun aw laysa shay'un asbara ala adha yasma'uhu min Allahi azza wa jal. More or less meaning in English, there is no one in the whole universe, there is no such thing in the whole universe that is more patient and that is more forbearing than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the entire, we'll go in detail what does it mean. In the entire universe, no one is more patient and more forbearing than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the affairs withstanding the hurt and the pain and the suffering that comes from the other side. In easy words, none of us or no human being in the world or no Nabi in the world is on, is on such a high level as Allah himself that he is the one who is the most patient upon the calamities, upon the sufferings, upon the pain that makhluk, me and you cause to him. The question arises, Allah is capable of everything. So why, has Allah, why does Allah need to bear the pain and suffering? So we need to understand this. We cause pain and suffering to Allah and in the universe Allah is the most patient and he bears our pain and suffering. How do we cause pain and suffering to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Innahum layad'oona lahu walad. People associate partners with Allah. People say Allah has a son. People say Allah has a daughter. The kuffar of Makkah used to say the angels are the daughters of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So can there be a much bigger oppression and zulm than associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The biggest zulm is shirk. The biggest oppression in the sight of Allah is associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah mentions in the Quran, Allah forgives everything, but Allah does not forgive shirk associating partners with Allah unless the person repents before death, otherwise Allah will not forgive him. So people cause most pain and suffering to Allah and Allah bears it, Allah is forbearing, Allah is patient to such an extent they accuse Partners with Allah, wa innahum la yu'afihim wa yarzukuhum. Allah provides security to them also, Allah sustains them also. They are against Allah, but still Allah sustains them. To such an extent that if we look in a general view, the people who are disobeying Allah are getting the most blessings of Allah today. If in a general view we see, People who disobey Allah are getting the most blessings of Allah around the world. Look at the patience, the level and the intensity of the patience and forbearance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Sheikh Saadi rahimahullah, a Persian poet, people who are from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh know him. He said a couplet in Farsi, more or less meaning in English is, Urdu mein kehte hain ke Allah ka dastar khan barabar hai, chahe dost ho, chahe dushman ho, Allah dono ko khilata hai. The, the dining table, the eating mat, the dastar khan of Allah is equal for a believer also and for a non-believer also. Allah provides for his friends also, Allah provides for his enemies also. This is a level of the forbearance and patience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So from this we should learn that how much patience should we have, how much forbearance should we have in our everyday life. In the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ اللَّهِ Cultivate the character, the qualities of Allah within yourself. Try to develop the akhlaq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within yourself. We cannot imitate, na'uzu billah, we cannot imitate Allah or we cannot develop the same qualities that Allah has, but it means it is the quality of Allah that He is patient 
upon the upon the shortcomings of his creation so at the same time we should learn based on our level and capacity to have the forbearance and patience and we should learn to forgive others when people come up with their deficiencies and with their shortcomings so through this hadith rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam further emphasizes on this that we have to have patience and forbearance in everyday life if this thing is missing every other day we will have disputes among ourselves very every other day that there will be a quarrel and there will be animosities and grudges among ourselves one person if one is shouting the opposite side should remain quiet let him finish let him vent out the heat if two people start shouting at the same time there will be no end to it you won't reach a solution okay. So these are the things that the Sharia, that, the, that Islam gives us to have a peaceful life. And now the question arises, Islam only emphasizes to the person who's being hurt, who's being afflicted to remain calm, to remain patient. Why does Islam does not say anything to the person who is oppressing in the first place, who is doing the zulm in the first place? So the answer to this is Islam gives instructions of both of these people. On the per for the person who is being oppressed, Islam says being patient, be patient, have forbearance. Taqallaku bi akhlaqillah. Develop and cultivate the akhlaq, the manners of Allah in yourself. And the person who is oppressing, Islam tells him not to oppress, otherwise Allah will punish him on the day of judgment. There are many ahadiths of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. As long as the hukukullah are concerned. As long as the rights of Allah are concerned, Allah forgives them in this dunya. But as far as the rights of the humanity are concerned, Allah does not forgive them unless the human being forgives in the first place. The hukukul ibad, the rights of the people, Allah does not forgive even if we repent to Allah. Make tawbah to Allah. Allah does not forgive them unless the person who is oppressed forgives in the first place. I'll give you two examples. We know in the chapter of backbiting, in the chapter of ghibah, that if you backbite someone and you seek forgiveness from Allah, Allah will not forgive you unless that person forgives you. That's why the fuqaha, the jurists have mentioned this ruling in the books of tafsir and the books of fiqh, that you backbite it. For example, Zaid, Amr, Bakr. Three people are there, Zaid, Amr and Bakr. Zaid backbited. In front of Amr regarding Bakr. Bakr is away, he's absent. This is the exact definition of backbiting. You talk bad about someone that if you say the same thing in front of him, he feels hurt, but he's absent in his, on his back. You are doing this thing, you are saying this thing. So Zaid, Zaid backbited Am, uh, Bakr in front of Amr. Now Amr carries this news to Bakr. Look in so and so location, such and such time, Zaid said so and so about you. So now, Bakr gets affected, gets hurt and says, no, this is not the reality. This is, it is not such. Okay? So now the backbiting is carried all the way to Bakr has reached its destination. Now Zaid cannot get his sin forgiven unless he seeks forgiveness from Bakr. If Amr did not carry this news in the first place, he just, di he just digested him himself. Then Zaid does not need to, need to seek forgiveness from Bakr. He just needs to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if backbiting reaches its destination, you have to seek forgiveness from that person. If backbiting is still pending in between, that's it. You need to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a clear evidence. As far as the rights of the humanity are concerned, Allah will not forgive us unless we seek forgiveness from the opposite side. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions in a hadith mentioned by Imam Bayhaqi rahimahullah in his Shu'abul Iman. There are two narrations. The first narration is more or less to the nearest meaning. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, al ghibatu ashaddu min al zina More or less meaning in English, backbiting is much worse than fornication and adultery. Backbiting is much worse than fornication and adultery. Sahaba radiallahu anhum were amazed. O Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how is it such? Kayfa dhalik? How is it such? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied to the nearest meaning, when a person commits adultery or fornication, he seeks forgiveness from Allah, Allah forgives him. He seeks forgiveness from Allah, Allah forgives him. 
The narration ends here. There is another narration. When a person does commits adultery and fornication, Allah forgives him. But a person, when Allah, but Allah will not forgive the backbiter unless he for, seeks forgiveness from the person whom he backbited. Allah does not forgive the backbiter unless he seeks forgiveness from the person whom he backbited. In a third narration, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that Allah forgives adultery and fornication because a human being takes it as a heavy sin, as a big, big sin, and right away he repents. All of a sudden afterwards, on the first day he has some remorse. But as far as backbiting is concerned, people take it light. When people take it light, they don't seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the first place. That's why Allah does not forgive him. So this is a clear evidence and proof from the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the rights of others are not forgiven unless we seek forgiveness from them. Another incident, a sahabi came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, O oh Rasulullah, uh, if my slave, if my servant, if my employee commits a mistake, does something wrong, does not follow my orders, am I allowed to punish him? Am I allowed to punish him? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, You are allowed to punish him to such an extent that your punishment should be equal to the level of his mistake. Your punishment, the intensity of your punishment should be equal to the level of his mistake. Tumhari saza ka jo darja hai, wo uski ghalti ke darje ke barabar ho. Agar tumhari saza uski ghalti ke darje se bad jayegi, to qayamat ke din uska haath hoga, tumhara girewaan hoga. Or agar tumhari saza uski ghalti se kam hogi, to jo badla reh gaya hai, qayamat ke din Allah paak ho tumhye ata farma dhenge. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if your punishment is more severe, is more intense, is much bigger in size, is more effective as compared to the bad effect of his mistake, then on the day of judgment it will be his hand and your body. And he will seek revenge from you on the day of judgment. And none of us can bear this. And if your punishment is lesser in degree, is lesser in intensity, as compared to his mistake, then whatever remains, Allah will grant you from his treasures on the day of judgment. Okay. So which is better? To seek revenge in this world? To seek badla in this world? Or is it better, better, it is more cautious, it is to be on the safe side to forgive for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was the mizaj, this was the nature, this is how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam brought up this ummah. This is how he... He developed and cultured the Sahaba and nourished the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Try to emphasize more on forgiveness. As far as the person who is oppressing, stop him from oppression. As far as the person whom being op who is being oppressed, then seek forgiveness. Or then uh, cultivate this, this quality in him that he should forgive the opposite person for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the Sahabi heard this, the hadith continues. When the Sahabi radiallahu anhum heard this, all of a sudden, out, un, out of control, he shouted. And he said, O oh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I might have done ziyati, I might have done oppression, and I might have done mistreatment to my slaves because I don't have a thermometer or any tool to measure that his mistake is on the same level as my punishment or is there a difference between the two. Mere paas to koi aisa aala nahi hai jiske zariye mein naapu koi paimana to nahi hai ki kiski cheez galti zada thi ya saza zada thi. To mujh se to ho sakta hai ki itni zati ho gai ho. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, did not, do you did not read what Allah says in the Quran? فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَهُ وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًا يَرَهُ More or less meaning in English, whoever does anything good, it will be presented in front of him on the day of judgment. And whoever even does an iota of something bad, an iota of a sin or an iota of a good deed, it will be presented in front of him on the day of judgment. Not a single thing will be missing on the day of judgment. So how would we stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So this is it. This story, this incident tells us. And at the end, the Sahabi radiallahu anhum replied, O Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I free my slave. 
not to have in them in the first place is a better thing than to have him and punish him on his mistakes. So this gives us an idea and an understanding that as far as the rights of the people are concerned, Allah will not forgive us unless we seek forgiveness from the opposite person. So this is in this category, it's better to have sabr and Allah has given us the right of revenge. In the Quran, it is, uh, the Quran mentions about it. The ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa mention about it. But to, be, to have it measured is the most delicate part. So that's why in everyday life, first of all myself and all of us, in certain situations, we need to reprimand the opposite person. We need to take a stand. Otherwise, then the community will all of the the community on the large scale will go astray. In the matters of deen, we cannot be flexible because otherwise the deen of Allah would be distorted. So what I am saying is a general understanding and a general education of deen. For specific matters, we should refer to the ulama ikram, to the scholars, that this is a specific situation. What does Allah command me? Should I just go ahead and forgive that person? Or do I need to take a step to a certain level so that opposite person could not repeat this mistake again? One is that the harm is on your individual level. You have the right to forgive or not to forgive. But one is the harm is on a general level, on a community level. Now, if you keep on forgiving like this, the entire community will be affected. Many people will be affected. So in that case, we have to refer to the scholars, to the ulama ikram, that what is the ruling of Islam in such and such case and what should we do. One of the students of Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, Qaziul Quzat, Imam Abu Yusuf, rahimahullah, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, mentions that the first person in the history of Islam to get the title of Chief Justice, Qazi al Quzat in Arabic means Chief Justice. Chief Justice of not a country, of not a continent, Chief Justice of the entire Muslim Empire. In a time of Umar radiallahu an, 2.2 million square miles. Imagine the expansion after it. This was the time of Khilafat Abbasiyah, the Abbasid, Abbasid Khilafah. And Qazi Abu Yusuf rahimahullah, the most celebrated student of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, was titled the first Chief Justice in the history of Islam after the time of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. He wa- it was the time of his death, and he- there were signs of depression and concern on his face. People asked him, why are you so much concerned? Kyu parishan hai aap? Why are you depressed? He said, I recalled all my mistakes and all my shortcomings in the life. And I have sought forgiveness from Allah. I have repented from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I hope from Allah that Allah, out of the mercy and rahmat of Allah, that Allah has forgiven me. But there is one thing that I wasn't able to complete seeking forgiveness. Seek, I mean, and I cannot, my repentance is, is incomplete in that specific case and incident because of which I am concerned that Allah might question me on the day of judgment. And because of this question, I would be able to answer or reply anything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People ask, what is this? He said, once a case came to me, there was a plaintiff and a defendant. The plaintiff or a Muslim was a Muslim and the defendant was a non-Muslim. Now Islam tells us it's, the, it's, it's, it's among the rules for the justice, for, for the judge, uh, there, there is, there he, who, who is making a decision in the case. Whenever a dispute comes to you, you should treat both parties equally, though one of them is a non-believer. You should treat both parties equally, though one of them is a non-Muslim or a non-believer. One was a Muslim and one was a non-Muslim. I granted a good comfortable place of sitting for a Muslim and I did not grant a good comfortable place for a non-Muslim. Both were sitting, but there was a difference in majlis. There was a difference in a sitting place. Whatever judgment I made, alhamdulillah, it was according to the Quran and hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But there was a different and mistreatment and injustice as far as the majlis, the, you can say the comfortability of the chair is concerned. So I am concerned that maybe he would stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment and ask me for this injustice and I won't be able to reply to Allah. Because of this I am concerned. So these are the slight things that our pious predecessors really focused upon and were really concerned because this is from the category of hukuk al-ibad, the rights of others. 
Once again, as I mentioned, we all make mistakes, including on myself. We all have shortcomings. If, per if a person says, I should become perfect and I never make a mistake, this cannot happen. Okay? If you become perfect, Allah will kill us all and Allah will bring another generation. It comes in the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In Riyadh al-Salihin, Imam Nabawi rahimahullah has mentioned this hadith. If you stop doing sins, Allah will erase you from the face of this earth. And Allah will bring a new generation of human beings that will make sins and seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should not commit sins intentionally, but to a certain extent we are out of control and there will be a time still we will repeat the same sin. But we should have remorse, try our best, do whatever we can do that is in our control and then seek sincere forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the mizaj, this is the teaching of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as far as sabr is concerned and as far as patience is concerned. In everyday life, whether it's our family members, whether it's our children, whether it's our youngsters or whether it's our elders or whether it's our parents, we should learn these qualities to have patience to have sabr, okay, to forgive others for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is a time when we might commit something wrong. We might commit a mistake and we end up in a difficult situation and we hope for the mercy of the opposite person. We hope that maybe the opposite person will forgive me. In this case, when we are able to forgive others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also forgive us. If we mention in the first program regarding this chapter, regarding this topic, that in the time of before the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, there was a trader. Whenever he used to dispatch his workers, they used to go home to home to home or city to city to sell the goods. Whenever he used to dispatch them, he used to tell them, somebody comes to you, buys your item, but he cannot pay the full price. He is a poor person. Give him a discount. Don't deny him that thing. And when people come to you to return the credit, the qarz, the loan that is upon them, they bought the goods from you, but they have not returned the, they have not done the payment yet. They got a line of credit for a month or two months. Now they are coming back to return you the money. For some reason, they don't ha they have enough money. And the time has expired. Give them more time. The words of the haditha, Sahlan is a ba'a wa sahlan is a shtara. When he used to sell, he was flexible. When he used to buy, he was flexible. Okay. When he was presented in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah being alamul alimul ghayb, being, knowing everything, beginning and the end, Allah asked the angels, what does he have in his account? The angels said he does not have any major good deed in his account. Only for the thing that he had this quality, he used to tell his traders and his workmen that Sahalan is a ba'a, be flexible when you sell and be flexible when you buy and they used to do this thing. So what was the reply of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more or less to the nearest meaning as mentioned in the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah replied, he had this quality which belongs to me that he used to forgive the people so today I will forgive him. And he was allowed to enter Jannah on a day of judgment. So again, zulm will be done, oppression will be done, but we keep these things in front of us that how much forbearance and patience Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has and we should try to develop this. One is to learn and cultivate this thing in us and one is to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, give us the strength and give us the capability that we develop these good, good qualities in ourselves. One is to learn, one is to have knowledge, and one is to seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also. So if we develop this thing, inshallah, automatically the disputes that are there, people will still be there. People will still oppress us. People will still be bad with us. There are certain people, unfortunately to say, they never change. You give them chances, they keep on misusing and abusing you. Abusing, abusing the opportunities that you give them. But still for the sake of Allah, we, we ask the scholars that what is the limit? How much can we grow? How much can we go ahead? What is the fine line and where should we stop? And automatically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will return us. Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابِ More or less meaning in English, that Allah grants the people who have patient without any measurement on the Day of Judgment. Without any measurement. It comes in the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a person who is patient for the sake of Allah in this world, on the Day of Judgment, Allah will give him so much in return, many, many fold multiplied, that the people, the onlooking people, the onlooking majma will say that we wish our bodies would have been cut with scissors of metal in this world. 
We wish that our bodies would have been cut with the scissors of metal in this world, so we would have gained the same reward as this person is gaining. Because he had sabr, because he had patience in the, in, 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 in the world, in the material life. We look at the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam returned from a battle and the ghanima, the spoils of war, now were being distributed. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave some to the Mahajireen, some to the Ansar, some to immigrants of Makkah al Mukarrama, and some to the Ansar, the, the helpers from Madinah al Munawwara. In a few occasions that happened, the new Muslims, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave them more. People who were inclined towards Islam but had not accepted Islam yet, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam granted them the spoils of war as a gift also. As it happened in the battle of Hunayn, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave everything to the people who were new Muslims and to some of the people who were inclined towards Islam but Islam had not fully entered their heart yet. Few of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum got affected by this. This is another incident, the hadith that I'm trying to mention in front of you is because of this distribution on an occasion other than the battle of Hunayn, a Sahabi spoke with another Sahabi and said the distribution that was done by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam today was not according to the command of Allah. The distribution that was done by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Today was not according to the pleasure of Allah. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an overheard this conversation. He went straight to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah was sitting in a majlis. Imam Bukhari rahimahullah mentions this narration in Adab al-Mufrad. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sitting with the sahaba radiallahu anhum. And Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an just uh, alerted him, said, conveyed this incident in his ear. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became angry. The impressions changed on his face. His face I mean, turned pale. It is mentioned in the hadith when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi used to become angry, blood would come under his veins as somebody becomes angry and his emotions. All of a sudden, his skin turns reddish. It comes in the hadith that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi skin would become reddish to such an extent as if somebody has taken out the juice of the pomegranate. So much reddishness would come on the face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he became, he became angry and signs of anger came on his face. Ibn Masood radiallahu an says, the narration goes on. I wish I would have not alerted Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I wish I would have not transferred the incident in the first place. Because of so much anger, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied that so and so prophet was given much more hardships than me. He was caused more pain and suffering than me, but he was patient upon the pain and suffering. I would also be patient upon the pain and suffering. Okay? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has taught us these akhlaq, that we for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should develop patience in our hearts and in our minds and in our everyday life. Automatically Allah will grant us. Allah will not make us lose anything. Okay? If we are doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will surely grant us in this dunya also and in the hereafter also. Allah, we will see the result of this patience in our children also. We will see the good things coming to our children and the ni'mas of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the life of our children. Those people who bear pain and suffering from humanity for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah grants them in this dunya also and in the hereafter also. And to end this, my respected elders and brothers, all these things that we hear in the bayans on daily basis, whether in Juma Salah or Sunday gatherings or Saturday gatherings or in the conventions or in majmas or retreats, these are all talks about deen, about Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One is to hear these things and one is to literally develop these things in our everyday life. Allah has made me and you such that Allah has made us prone to the environment. We are not immune from the environment where we are living. We are prone to the environment. To such an extent, once we leave this, this, this gathering of the masjid, we can feel for ourselves that after a while the situation of the heart changes. The emotions of the heart changes because we have gone in another environment. Okay? The, the, 
the dua Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentions as far as uh, entering the masjid. This is just to make me and you understand. I'm giving this example. This is not the topic today. When we hear enter the masjid, we say Allahumma ftahli abu abu rahmati. And when we and leave the masjid, we say Allahumma inni as'aluka min fadlik. O oh Allah, open up the doors of mercy for us. Rahma, the word Rahma is used when we enter the masjid. The word Fazl is used when we leave the masjid. What is the difference? We could do it vice versa also. When we enter the masjid, we should say Allahumma inni as'aluka min fadlik. What's the difference? There's a very fine difference that the ulama explained to us. Allahumma ftahli abu abu rahmatik. O oh Allah, open up the doors of mercy for me means mercy is for the hereafter. Fazl is for this world. This is what the ulama explained to us. I'm not going in detail. The dalil is from the Quran. Why is Fazl for this dunya and why is Rahma for the hereafter? So Rahma, we are asking Rahma from Allah because in the masjid we come for spiritual grooming. For, ed- for religious education. So we are asking for the mercy of Allah. Oh Allah, make us something for the hereafter. Grant us a level in the hereafter. When we leave the masjid, we are returning to our jobs. We are returning to our home. So we are asking the fazl of Allah. Oh Allah, grant us barakah in our sustenance. Grant barakah in our life. So this is the fine difference. We are going towards the dunya. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa teaches us to ask dunya to Allah. When we enter the masjid, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is teaching us to ask what we have to ask when we enter the masjid. So once we go outside the masjid, the environment affects us. And these emotions and jazbat that we have developed being in the masjid, so slowly they drain out. Slowly they come out. So how how to keep these things alive and these jazbats alive? We have to have the environment of deen. We have to develop the mahal of deen in our houses also, in our communities also, and in our masajids also. If the environment of deen is not there, why do good Muslims in America, take the example of America, why do good Muslims who have so much understanding of deen, I'm not criticizing anyone, who have so much understanding of deen, why do they try to buy a house or rent a house near the masjid? People come and say, I'm trying to find a house near the masjid, please guide me. What's the reason? Because of the spiritual environment that will affect them, their family members and their houses. If the environment of deen is not required, people will not live near the masjids. People don't need to live near the masjids. So why still we appreciate to live near the masjid? Because we are all in need of this environment. So like we need the environment of the masjid, we need a 24-hour constant environment in our houses also, at our job places also. Otherwise, we come only five times a day to the masjid. Most of the time, we spend outside the masjid. So if the outside environment is not almost the same or somewhat the same or 10% the same, or 20% the same as the environment in the masjid, it will be very difficult for us to act upon the deen. Our deen will only be limited to salah. Our deen will only be limited to fasting in Ramadan. Okay? Just because the reason I'm, what I'm trying to mention, I'm going in this detail, that is, about, that is beyond our topic today, but I'll end in five minutes. Okay? The ulama explained to us not to criticize anyone. One day before Ramadan, Eid comes, Eid al-Fitr, we see this, you see this, I see this, we see back in our countries also, we see here in our masjids also. It is around the whole world. On the last days of Ramadan, one night before Eid, the masjid is full. There is no place in the masjid. In Zohar Salah, maybe one or two safs in the masjid. Why is this? It's a difference of only 24 hours, 18 hours, 12 hours. What happened all of a sudden? Okay. The sal- command of salah is no more there? No. Because we had a value. People don't say this. Don't get me wrong. People don't say this by their tongue. But they prove by their actions. We prove myself. We prove by, not to say anyone I talk about myself. We prove by our actions as deen is limited to Ramadan. Deen is limited to 30 days a year. The remaining 335 days, there is no deen. We don't need to come to a masjid. If I'm wrong, correct me. If deen is there for 365 days, what happened to Zohar and Asr today? What happened to Maghrib and Isha today? Why were you in the masjid just yesterday and not today? So this tells us by action we are saying deen is limited to time. Deen is limited to occasions. And deen is limited to venues. And this is what the other communities have also done. And now they are totally away from their deen. And unfortunately this has come in the Muslims also. They are not saying by their tongue but they are saying by their actions. What example are we giving to our new generations? When when they see from us that our fathers and mothers go to the masjid in Ramadan. Then afterwards 
that's it. We don't know the road towards the masjid anymore, only Jummahs and special occasions. My respected elders and brothers, what lesson are we giving them? How are they growing up? We should ask ourselves. So the purpose why I brought up this talk is we all need an environment, a 24-hour environment that is conducive to deen, that, it, that allows us to act upon a deen at least on a basic level. That's why an effort is required. What is that effort? The effort of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What was the effort of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he transferred to the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and the tabi'een and the tabatabi'een and the generations after them because of which me and you are born in Muslim houses today? The effort of da'wat. Calling people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Telling Amr bil ma'roof and nahi anil munkar. Calling people towards good and forbidding them from doing evil. This is a requisite of Islam. This is a major pillar of Islam, a major rukun of Islam. If we don't do this, Allah will question us on the day of judgment. The major difference between the ummahs, we ask any ulama among the whole world, the major difference among this um, between this ummah and the previous ummahs is Allah has given this ummah dual responsibility the previous ummahs had the responsibility of act to act upon the deen themselves but this ummah has a responsibility to invite others also for this effort the effort of dawat and tabligh is going on in the whole world we see jamaats coming from one locality to another locality from one masjid to another masjid i'll end in two minutes inshallah this is not something new. Sometimes we have this question in our mind that this is something, this is maybe an innovation. This is something new. Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmizi, Abu Dawud, Rahimahullah, have not mentioned, mentioned such effort of Babu Dawa, Fifi Sabilillah, or anything like this. So, my respected elders and brothers, this is not an innovation. This is not a new effort. This, is, this was so embedded in the Sahaba radiallahu anhum that they, did, they were not read it, needed to remind anyone. When I forgot the name of the Sahabi radiallahu an who, 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 who conquered, who, who, who spread Islam to Libya, Tarabilis and all these North African countries and when he came on the banks of the Atlantic Ocean, the books of history are testimony and witness to this. He looked towards the sky, he put the, the, the feet of his horse in the water and what did he say? Oh Allah, if I knew that there is humanity living beyond this ocean, I would go and cross this ocean and spread your word to that humanity also. Shaiban bin Farrukh rahimahullah, the father of Rabi Atur Rai rahimahullah, the teacher of Imam Bukhari and Imam Hanifa rahimahullah, his father Shaiban ibn Farrukh were among the Tabi'een rahimahullah when he went, he left his house for the expedition of Azerbaijan. His Shay Rabi Rabi Atur Rai was in the womb of his mother. When he returned back, Rabi Atur Rai was 27 years old, was one of the biggest teachers in the Masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So what is this? This is a clear dalil that Allah has given us the responsibility based on our capacity to spread the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in different corners of the world. For this purpose, alhamdulillah, jamaats come. We, we are blessed that alhamdulillah, jamaat is here in our locality. They have given sacrifice for travel such a long distance all the way from Malaysia. It's the ladies' jamaat. The ladies are there in the house of Brother Ijlal just nearby, two or three minutes drive from here. 76 Hoffman Avenue. The ta'aleem for the ladies, the session for the ladies is from 11 to 1 and then again 4.45 to 6 p.m. in the evening. The jamaat will leave tonight or tomorrow. They are here since yesterday and the men folk are here in the masjid. So whatever time we have, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, an hour, inshallah, we try to spend with them, learn from their experience and at the same time we take them and to meet the other brothers in the locality also. So much sacrifice they have given. If little bit we participate in the sacrifice, inshallah, whatever effort effort of deen they will do, Allah will give us somewhat reward of that also. So whatever was said and heard, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq to act upon these things. Ameen. Subhanallah wa bihamdi, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nasaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.